So welcome everybody to the last in our spring series of View from the Riverbank Talks. It's National Inv Non-Native Invasives Week next week, or INS Week as it's known. And so ahead of that, we're doing a public talk tonight, which is going to talk about some of the um, invasive non-native species that can be found in the Eden catchments. We're going to focus particularly on Himalayan balsam. It's really prolific, but actually there's a lot that everybody can do about it to get rid of this invasive alien species. We're also going to hear from Jenny Garbe, who's going to take us through a strategic approach that she's taking to managing invasive species in the trout bet catchment as part of her EU funded project. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Dave Greaves, who is our conservation officer for species and habitat, and he's going to tell us some more about the invasive species found here. Over to you, Dave. Good evening. Um, I'm just going to do a short presentation of uh, just a small number of invasive species that are found in the Eden catchment. There's many more than, than this. I'm just going to focus on some of the, the worst offenders we've got. Uh, so I'll just share my screen with you. Uh, so first up, we've got the American mink. Um, it's a small semi-aquatic mammal um, and it occupies both freshwater and saltwater habitats. And they like to follow waterways uh, such as lake edges, coastlines and of course rivers. It belongs to the mustelid family, so it's related to the otter, polecat, stoat, pine martin and weasel. It has a, a rich, usually really dark brown fur, uh, sometimes uh, black in appearance. It's got a narrow snout uh, and it's often got a white patch on the chin or the throat, though not always. Um, the size, um, they're usually around 30 to 47 centimetres in body length and the tail is around half the length of the body. Um, so they're a similar size to pole cats and uh, quite a lot smaller than uh, our native otter. The um, territorial and uh, the average um, mink territory along uh, a linear waterway may be up to around five kilometres for a male and between one and three kilometres for a female. Um, the footprints are usually between two and a half to four centimetres across, and they're often found along tracks leading to and from uh, water. Here's um, some fairly small ones, probably a female, uh, alongside a two pence piece um, for, a, for a size comparison. The carnivores and the wide variety of prey, including rabbits, Water voles, uh, as seen here, rats, birds, eggs, fish, and domestic fowl. They really are opportunistic hunters and they'll just take whatever prey is available at the time. Female mink can fit into water vole burrows and can wipe out entire colonies and populations along waterways. Um, mink are currently being controlled on many waterways across Britain, and hopefully, this should alleviate the predation pressure on many local populations of water voles. And in some areas where they managed to do this, they've had to they've had some successful water vol reintroductions. Control of mink uh, relies on detecting their presence uh, before trapping and shooting. A mink craft is a really low technology monitoring tool which encourages mink to leave evidence of their presence in the form of footprints. The raft uses a standardized mixture of clay and sand to record the tracks over a period of one to two weeks. And uh, because it's a raft and it's out there floating, it's unlikely to be uh, a poor cat, much more likely to be um, a mink who prefer to move around in water. Once a mink is detected on the raft, um, it becomes the best place to then set a trap. And the commonest result is that the mink is caught the next day because they are creatures of habit and they do tend to revisit uh, places in their territory and check, check out places uh, such as this like dark tunnel that's formed by the, the mink raft. Signal crayfish um, was introduced by the British government in the 1970s from North America to UK waters for export into uh, what was a, a lucrative Scandinavian market for food. They soon escaped from commercial fisheries and began to outcompete the native white clawed crayfish for habitat and food. But they also carry a disease known as crayfish plague, which is lethal to the native white clawed crayfish. They have decimated the native crayfish populations where present 
and signal crayfish cause further problems by burrowing into riverbanks, causing erosion, bank collapse and sediment pollution. The signal crayfish is uh, much more of a voracious predator than the white clawed crayfish and they feed on a variety of fish, frogs and invertebrates, as well as plants and even eating individuals of its own species. Because they're cannibalistic, um, it, it poses a big problem with population control. So con control of the signal crayfish is almost impossible in UK rivers. Studies have shown that trapping removes the larger, more aggressive crayfish, and due to them being cannibalistic within their populations, this allows the population then to grow as a whole. A smaller members who would normally be eaten by the bigger ones uh, are then allowed to reproduce, and you can end up having a, a larger biomass of crayfish causing more damage uh, in the end. For comparison, here's a, a white clawed crayfish. So with the signal crayfish, it's got these bright red undersides to the claw. claw. Um, they're not usually so strikingly bright, bright red, but you can definitely see that pigmentation. And they quite often have uh, a turquoise to pale blotch that's very distinctive on the upper claw. And uh, the males especially, but the females as well have got very large um, claws in proportion to the body uh, and in comparison with the white clawed crayfish as seen here which has got um, more whitish sometimes rose pink kind of colored uh, claw and lacking those blotches on the uh, outside of the hinge there. Another problem plant we have in the Eden catchment is the giant hogweed. And this was introduced to Britain and Europe from the Caucasus Mountains in the 19th century. The giant hogweed outcompetes other vegetation due to its size and it forms pure stands that expand from year to year if not controlled. It has flat seeds which are dispersed by the wind, water and by human activity. Although it's an impressive sight when fully grown and it can reach up to around 3.5 metres in height, Giant hogweed is invasive and potentially harmful. A signal flower head may have over 5,000 seeds and a plant may produce 50,000 to 80,000 seeds in its lifetime. Seeds are shed from late August to mid-October and seed present in the soil seed bank will generally continue to emerge for three to four years, but seeds have been known to be viable in some soils for up to 15 years. As you can see, they often have this purple blotchy coloration on the stands and uh, more sharply serrated leaves than the native hogweed. Chemicals um, which are in the sap can cause uh, photodermatitis or photosensitivity where the skin becomes very sensitive when it's exposed to sunlight and uh, may suffer blistering, pigmentation uh, and sometimes even long lasting scars. The effective control for a uh, Himalayan balsam is usually by spraying or injecting with glyphosate, though it can be controlled by digging out or uh, continually suppressing uh, with mulch. Japanese knotweed is another common uh, problem along our waterways. It's a frequent colonizer of uh, riparian ecosystems, um, as well as roadsides and brownfield sites. It forms thick, dense colonies which completely crowd out any other herbaceous species um, and the success of the species has been partially attributed to its tolerance of a very wide range of soil types, pH and salinity. It's a really tough plant. Its, its rhizomes or its root system can survive temperatures of minus 35 degrees Celsius and they can extend seven meters horizontally and up to three meters deep, making removal by excavation extremely difficult. The plant's also very resilient to cutting, um, vigorously re-sprouting from the roots, and it spreads very, very easily. If even a very small piece of the rhizome or the root system is broken off, it can regrow from that. As you can see here, it's got these uh, sometimes described as shield-shaped or spade-shaped leaves, um, which shoot from the, the stem nodes alternately, and it gives it this distinctly zigzag pattern to the stem typically blooming between late summer and early autumn, the Japanese knotweed flowers are a distinctly creamy white color and form in clusters of up to 10 centimeters long. They die back around October, uh, and then what's left behind are these hollow stems throughout the winter months. 
it's really tough and it can go through tarmac, it can go through brick walls and even through concrete if it finds a, a weak spot in some kind of broken or degraded concrete. This large underground network of roots, rhizomes that develop, um, all need to be killed to kill the plant. So all the above ground portions of the plant need to be controlled repeatedly for seven years in order to weaken and kill the entire patch. Um, this is usually done by repeated spraying um, over several years or through stem injection, uh, again with glyphosate. Whilst all the other invaders I mentioned are really difficult to control uh, and, and almost impossible in some cases, and it's sometimes best to, to seek advice before tackling something like giant hogweed yourself, one thing we can all do is uh, tackle this invasive species, which is Himalayan balsam. And my colleague, Jenny Payne, is going to talk to us a bit more about how we can do this. Thank you, Dave. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jenny. I'm uh, the volunteer coordinator and, um, well, part-time part anyway. Um, and one of the things we do with our volunteers is control of Himalayan balsam. Um, it's not hard to handle or toxic. In fact, you can eat the seeds if you want to. And it even smells like, nice when you're bashing it and anybody can do it. So it's where our ERT volunteers really come into their own. You can see from this picture quite how much some people enjoy doing this and take it from me, it can get really addictive once you get going. Now, uh, when our volunteers go out balsam bashing, they do bash it by the river and they bash it in the fields and they bash it along the footpaths. And then some of them even get into the river to bash it. You get the drift. It doesn't just grow by rivers though. It's also found taking over where conditions are suitable. So this is a bit of wet field along the um, side of the river in uh, Long Martin, just down by the bridge. And it's quite a wide bit of field, but the Himalayan balsam is busy taking over the whole field there. Uh, one of the joys of balsam bashing is that it's generally ridiculously easy to pull it up. The root ball is relatively small and the best thing to do with it once it's been pulled up is to pile it up in a heap in the sun so that it can heat up and compost down. This is where sometimes things get a little bit silly, but it's always good to have a bit of fun as well. In the right situation, a pile like this will decompose incredibly quickly in the sun, uh, but by the following year, there shouldn't be a lot left of it at all. And for our volunteers, it really is pretty much as easy as that. There's always a thing that the more we know about Himalayan balsam and the things that make it such a phenomenally successful invader, the more effective we can be in getting rid of it. So a few of the details about this plant. It is a problem all over the country. Himalayan balsam is advancing around Britain fast enough to cover an area the size of the Lake District National Park every four years. These beautiful flowers that it has are part of the problem. Uh, pretty much amounts to a superpower. The Himalayan balsam has flowers that produce more pollen than any European flower. And that makes them extra attractive to pollinators like the bees and they will preferentially confine themselves exclusively to Himalayan balsam plants. The flowers are followed by seed pods, which would be superpower too. Um, and the pods dry out and eventually explode, propelling up to 200 to 400 seeds per plant out into the world. So not as prolific as uh, some of the plants that Dave's been talking about, but still pretty impressive. Uh, this has been captured on a little film by some of our volunteers, Corentin and Ellie. And so we're going to show you their little film now. There. Quite something, isn't it? The suspense. Now, these seeds are not ripe yet. They're um, black when they're ripe, uh, but those came out of one of those little pods. 
when the pod splits, those seeds are propelled up to four metres in any direction round the plant. And that means they can spread outwards to seed an area of approximately 50 metres squared just from one plant. These seeds are really the secret superpower. They're light enough to float in water, small enough to get picked up on the coat of a passing deer or in the tread of a boot or car tire. So human activity can spread this stuff too. They can also remain viable, waiting for the right conditions to germinate for up to two years. Um, the Himalayan superpower four is its amazing power to grow. So if anyone's been out looking for it at the moment this year, they'll know it's not really very big. In fact, it's mostly as small as this and it's barely recognisable. Um, the next photo was taken in August last year. And for anybody that doesn't know Phil, he's a real giant. So this indicates just how quickly Himalayan balsam can put on the inches. That's naught to head height in three months. So quite impressive growth rate there. Uh, growing so tall and so dense in such a short time means that Himalayan balsam can make short work of outgrowing and outcompeting our native more moderate vegetation. That often leaves bare soil beneath the stems when the plant dies off in winter. And then that acts as the perfect seed bed for the latest crop of Himalayan balsam seeds to land on and germinate into and off it goes again. A small stand of Himalayan balsam low down by the river's edge could be overlooked and easily overlooked. So that's quite a small little bit, but it's quite tall. If you just had five plants there, you might miss it. But then when you start putting the numbers in, if you have five plants and they produce 300 seeds each with a germination rate of 85%, that would give you over a thousand plants in the first year and a massive 325,000 plants in just two years. So quite impressive and you can see why it invades quite so rapidly. The nodes along each stem of the Himalayan balsam have another superpower which also helps the plant take over and each one of these can send out extra roots. Oh there we go. Each one of these nodes can take out extra roots, uh, sorry, <laughs> lost myself completely, put down extra roots and also shoot to make an extra stem. So for plants that either fall over or drop into the wet ground, this means that they can grow a new Himalayan balsam plant at each node along the length of the stem. So in the case of the plant in this picture, there are five nodes along the length of the stem that would be five plants instead of just one and then if you do the numbers thing again that's instead of 300 seeds this now monster plant is going to give you up to 100 uh, sorry 1500 seeds uh, jetting out to make a new colony so when we're tackling himalayan balsam the real secret is to start pulling it up nice and early in the season before it's had a chance to flower. That's if you can recognise it without the pink. Um, our volunteers all have their own unique style of bashing, but good bashing techniques focus on really mashing up those nodes when you pull up the plant so that you're neutralising that power of the plant to just get away and shoot from everywhere. The bottom node is usually right next to the roots, so it's important to separate the existing roots from the bottom node and do that just by snap, snapping the stem just above the root ball. We keep on beating up the nodes and the stems as we pile them into a mound and then all that jumping around on the pile just makes sure everything is well and too, truly squished and it also makes a good place for a cup of tea at the end of the session. If there's a lot of balsam and possibly not so many people to pull it and you're not going to finish, you need to start getting strategic about which bits you pull and which bits you don't. So when you think about it, pulling balsam right next to the riverbank means that seeds and plants are less likely to end up in the water where they could be carried downstream to start a new colony. And then it doesn't just work if you, if you pull it on your own patch but if you don't know where it's coming from, it's just going to reseed into your patch again. So it's much better to trace it further upstream and pull it out and clear it permanently. 
So this uh, picture on the uh, right was Himalayan balsam and then this one here is the following year in the same place. It's a bit at a different angle but it is the same bit of fence line. That's actually one of the same people as well. So one of our same volunteers that really is into balsam pulling. Um, so you, what you're aiming to do is just get rid of it further upstream. Having said that, it is quite amazing the difference that just one person can make. This is Brian. He found a little island and he was going to pull out all the balsam on the island and he started at 11.04 in the morning uh, on a volunteer session and then by 12 o'clock he had actually made quite a visible space in the middle of his island and he sat there and had his lunch and then worked a bit harder in the afternoon and uh, got through a bit more and then he finally left the island at 3.39 p.m. with all the balsam on that fit on that little island pulled out. So it's it's a really satisfying thing to do when you come out and you set yourself a little patch and a target and then you achieve it. There are plenty of opportunities for anyone who's interested to get involved, some of which Sam will tell you about later. Do come and join us or join in with, there's a number of conservation groups out there doing all sorts of activities focused around balsam. You can do it anywhere you like in Cumbria. Lots of people trying to join forces to get rid of Himalayan balsam for good. This is absolutely a numbers game um, getting rid of this plant it's just getting people out and so it really is a case of the more people get involved the merrier that's great jenny thank you very much for that some of those numbers in how the plant can spread so quickly are, are absolutely astonishing i can't get over that from something that only had five plants in its first year could then go on to create 325,125 by year three that's amazing and just think of the difference we could make if we could get to those plants just that bit earlier it's absolutely fabulous so with that ringing in our ears, what I'd like to do now is hand over to Jenny Garbe, who will tell you what she's been doing to try and reduce this huge issue we have with invasive species, particularly in the trout back. Over to you, Jenny. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to do a little short section on um, some ongoing project work that we've got um, to reduce balsam in a strategic way. So we're currently in the middle of a project in the trout bet catchment. Um, you can see a map of it on screen there. So it's just north of Appleby um, and the trout bet river enters the Eden um, down at Kirby Thor. Um, the project that we've got going is funded through the Water Environment Grant, which is funding through DEFRA. Um, and the overall aims are to carry out habitat improvement works in the catchment area. There's three main um, elements of work um, through this project, one of which is balsam removal um, that I'll come on to. Um, but first I'll just explain the other two, um, two areas of work. So the first one being um, channel, um, we're looking at improving channel modifications. Um, so that's, for example, looking, to, look at, looking at areas where rivers have been straightened um, or improving fish passages and weirs and other barriers. So the project example that you can see here is um, a, a river restoration site that we did at Flake Bridge last year, uh, where we carried out an assisted natural recovery approach on a straightened and incised river. So the new channels um, now mean that there's more room for the water um, and um, a slower flow through the new meanders, um, and that can help to reduce the downstream flood risk. Um, and it also means that there's a, that the river is more connected to its floodplain, so the water can flood onto the floodplain easier and more frequently, which is more of a natural way, um, which creates more storage and also creates nice wetland habitat, as you can see in the picture there. The second area of work um, is looking at creating riparian buffer strips. Um, so as you can see in the picture there, um, when livestock um, enter the river, it can create a lot of fine sediment input from the poaching up both on the bank and, and in the river itself. Um, and that therefore um, reduces the, the, the quality of the, of, of the water. So what we look to do is fence off areas like this. Um, so 
by fencing off the river um, improves the water quality um, and the, the clean, clean gravels can provide better habitat for, for fish and inverts. Um, the next picture um, should be showing one that we've done at, um, at Gypsum Land, um, which is just up from Kirby Thor. Um, so this is where we, uh, we, we fenced off quite a long stretch of river. Um, and by planting trees inside the fenced area can help create a barrier from any surface water flow um, and soil runoff from the fields, as well as all the biodiversity improvements from, from planting the trees themselves. And the final area that um, I want to talk about is the um, balsam removal. So in 2018, we hired some ecological consultants to do um, a full catchment walkover to map where the balsam is in the catchment. So you can see in this map, the, the red areas um, show where the balsam is present. Um, and the more zoomed in map um, that we'll see in a sec um, shows um, where, 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 where you can actually see it follows, um, you can see that it follows the line of the river, um, but only on certain tributaries. So there's a tributary cut coming in from the, the kind of southeast um, that doesn't have any on it, um, but the one coming in from the north um, does. So it shows us where we should be um, concentrating our efforts. So once we had that map, we could then set up a removal plan um, working from upstream to downstream. Um, as seeds can quite easily be transported by the river, if a patch is removed at a more downstream end, then it's only going to take one seed to, to repopulate that area. So it's quite important if you're looking at a strategic approach to removal to start at the upstream end of the river and work your way down. But this isn't to say that you shouldn't remove it anywhere, as, as Jenny's already explained, um, it, it helps remove it absolutely anywhere, especially in areas where it's um, establishing quite large, um, large areas uh, which extend far away from the river. So what we did with this was we split the whole reach into four reaches and planned to do, for example, reach one in the first year, followed by reach two in the second year but also in the second year doing a sweep of reach one um, to just make sure that we've got it all and we haven't, we haven't missed any um, and, um, and we've tackled any that, um, that, that might, have, might have come up again. Um, and lastly, just to note, the, the, ed the education and publication around the biosecurity is very important. As it's already been discussed, um, people and vehicles can easily spread it around. Um, so it's quite important to you know, put signs up where removal's happening um, and it's, you know, community involvement is, um, is very key to the success of these types of projects. So, thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Jenny. It's, it's really interesting to see the approach that's going on, taking this upstream approach, really getting it before the seeds start to spread down the river. And actually, biosecurity is a really key thing, which I'm going to come on to in a second. Just before we move on, of course, we couldn't do any of this work without our supporters. And at the moment, we are supported by the Heritage Fund and also by the EU Agricultural Fund for Rural Development to help us carry out some of this really vital work in the Eden catchment and hopefully rid our area of invasives and let our native species thrive and survive. But as has been mentioned already, we've, it's been mentioned about biosecurity. And this is a really, really key thing that we do need to remember, because as Jenny's just said, you can actually go out and bash some balsam yourself. It's a really easy plant to get rid of. But there is a real danger that actually you don't want to take any of these aliens home with you. So it's always think biosecure before you leave a site. There's three simple steps that you can follow. First off, check. So check your equipment and clothing for mud, for any aquatic animals, any plant materials, seeds or other living organi organisms that could have attached themselves to any of your boots or your equipment or whatever. Or you might have just brushed against something. It's very, very easy to do. If you're on the river, it's really important with your equipment because things could attach to your kayak or to any other equipment that you've got in the river. So remove anything that finds itself on your clothes or your equipment and leave it there at that site. That's the really important thing. Don't let it go anywhere else with you or spread to another site. Next is all about cleaning. And so you should be washing everything thoroughly as soon as you can and pay particular attention to any of those little damp or hard to inspect bits, because we all know that things can live quite happily in those. If you, can, if you can, try and use hot water wherever possible because that's more likely to kill off anything that might have attached itself. 
if you do find some clingers on at home, wash them away from as, as long as you wash them off away from other bodies of water or from surface drains, because as we know, a lot of street surface drains just go directly to the river and you don't want them washing down there, back out into the river and back to causing a problem again. Ideally, if you can leave your um, stuff on a hard surface, that makes a really big difference as well. And third, dry. This is the really key thing. Dry all your equipment and clothing really thoroughly. Ideally, when I talked about a hard surface earlier, this is where this can really help. Because if you can leave your clothes and equipment out on a hard surface for a long time, then those aliens are not going to be able to catch hold onto anything. And something to be aware of with some of these species is actually they can live for up to two weeks in damp conditions. So that's why drying them out on a good hard surface in the sun can make such a huge difference. So just think every time you're going out to the river and thinking about coming home, if you're going out for family picnics or you're going to go out and do a bit of balsam bashing, clean, check, dry. Our friends at South Cumbria Rivers Trust have got lots of really good information about the clean, check, clean, check check clean dry even I will get my teeth in the the check clean dry process so please look at them on google and go and find South Cumbria Rivers Trust also ditch the alien hitchhikers is part of a public campaign that we're running at the moment called Act for Eden so if you're thinking about going out why not make it a promise that you will ditch the alien hitchhikers and regularly check your equipment if you visit actforeden.org.uk you'll find this promise and another nine promises there as well that you can have a go at and all these promises are there to help all of us try and do our bit to make Eden's rivers cleaner and healthier places for everybody but we have a whole section on alien hitchhikers hikers with lots more hints and tips on there as well so it's definitely well worth a look and as Jenny Payne mentioned earlier we have got some balsam bashing events so if we have given you the bug for getting involved this is what we've got going on this summer during June, July and August, we're going to have volunteer days where we'll be bashing balsam all over the place. So please just visit the Eden Rivers Trust website to keep an eye on the events that are coming up if you'd like to take part in that. Then from the 1st of July to the 11th of July, we've got the big balsam bash week where we're going to be out and about bashing balsam. And we really encourage you to go out into your local area and bash the balsam as well. If you haven't done it before and you'd like a little bit of help or a bit of support or just a, a nice day out with some like-minded people and we'll all bash balsam together, we're going to be having training days. One will be on Thursday the 1st of July and one on Saturday the 3rd of July. So we'll do a little bit of training and then you can come and bash some balsam as well. So it's just a really nice way to ease yourself into it if you're not so sure what you're looking for or have never tried it before. Again, just keep an eye on our website. And on the 10th of July, as part of the big balsam bash week, we'll be having a community balsam bash day. So that'll be something to look out for as well. So as I said, with all of these, if you just keep an eye on edenriverstrust.org.uk for the details of the events as they come up, they should be coming onto the website in the next few weeks. And if you'd like to take part in this, these balsam bash events or any others, please email volunteers at edenrt.org and we'll get you booked onto one as soon as possible. So thank you very much. So now I'd like to invite all the rest of the panelists to put their videos and back on and unmute themselves. And we'll see if we've got any questions. Everybody out there, you are very, very quiet tonight. We actually haven't got any questions at the moment. So if you'd like to ask the panel a question, and it would be really great to hear from you, please can you go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and just tap in a question for us. But in the meantime, I have got a couple of questions, just a few that I prefer I prepared earlier. So the first one I've got is for Jenny Payne. So Jenny, um, you've talked about how everybody can do balsam bash, but I know there's been some community groups out there that have really sort of taken, grasped the nettle as it were, and have taken the lead in bashing balsam. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about those groups? Yes, there's, there are indeed. So um, Eden Rivers Trust takes out volunteers to go and bash the balsam, but in some areas around our catchment, there are groups where people have just seen a little bit of balsam and got the bug for themselves and then rounded up their mates and then gone out and bashed it. So particularly in Wetherall, they've actually achieved something I didn't think was possible. They've uh, more or less 
taken down the balsam that was thick on the banks of the main Eden River um, and over a period of four years they've got to the point where you can barely see any at all and if you do see it it's a tiny little weak little plant um, in amongst the other vegetation and they've just literally done that by going out every time they do a bit of dog walking they've pulled a few stems they do break it up and smash the nodes up and then they load them up underneath a tree they put a little ribbon red ribbon in the tree and that is their balsam tree for that year they leave all the stems there so they know where to look just in case any have rerouted and come up again uh, they can keep track of that and within four years even though they have made this beautiful seed bank on the on the banks of the Eden for more Himalayan balsam to seed into they've actually managed to get it down to virtually nothing which is it's quite incredible what they've done there are other uh, community groups and a sort of combined group activities all over Cumbria so um, around Oldswater around Rydalwater uh, the Friends of the Lake District go out as, as a group and have a big balsam bash in the summer so this is something if you just put balsam and summer and Cumbria into Google <laughs> again you will you'll come up with a whole load of activities out there. That's brilliant. Actually, that leads me on to another question. And when you've just mentioned about the plants rerouting, if you leave them in a big pile like you showed some of the volunteers doing, are they likely to reroute from that or will that actually kill them off? Um, they they will cut they will actually compost down. If you've got them in the right place, because the stems are so sappy um, and juicy, it's it's very watery plant, uh, which is why it grows so quick, I think. Um, they they will compost down and if you break the roots off underneath that bottom node then the roots can't reshoot mm -hmm. um, so it can't flower so it can't do any damage um, and then the other bits of the plant if the nodes are mashed then they can't either root or shoot and then when you pile stuff on top of that layer you're actually not giving them anything to root or shoot into. <laughs> so, so they actually do dry up and compost down actually remarkably quickly. I've seen a pile like that one disappear virtually to nothing in two weeks in, wow. in sunshine. So, um, yeah. That's really good to know, actually. So, you know, when you do bash something, it is going to kill it off. That's great. Dave, I've got a question for you now from one of the participants. Um, who do I contact if I see a mink in the wild? That's a good question. Um, there's an app you can get on your phone called iRecord um, and you can record any species on that and that will ensure the records get sent to um, they'll be sent to verification to the local mammal expert and then they'll appear at the record centre. So if anybody would like to find out about records for me, they can look there. Um, you can report it to us and um, we can't guarantee we'll be able to do anything about it. There are some people who are out in, in the Eden catchment uh, who run their own voluntary trapping scheme and dispatching of mink. These people are quite few and far between, so I can contact the person who coordinates that. And if they've got um, somebody who is a volunteer nearby who traps close by, um, maybe they can do something about this. But it, it is a problem in that um, they can live uh, pretty much anywhere and they can run, mm. swim, climb. Uh, so they're, they're very good at what they do. Um, but yeah, you can report to us, but by, by all means, and we can see if we can do anything, but please certainly make sure it's recorded somewhere and the iRecord app's a really good place to do that. That's great. That's a really useful thing to know. I wasn't aware of the iRecord app. So yeah, I should be taking a look at that after the session as well. Um, Jenny Garvey, can I ask a quick question for you? So sort of this project, is this the first time you've had a project like this where inns removal has been such an integral part of a sort of river restoration, river habit habitat improvement project? Uh, yeah, I think I think so. I think, um, you know, th this is a really uh, unique project in that we're looking at one whole catchment area and looking at improving, improving the habitat within that whole area. And of course, invasives are a big part of that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the first project that I know where we've done that integral work. That's great. And hopefully more to come <laughs> in other parts of the catchment. That would be really nice. Oh, well, folks, we haven't got any more questions. So um, I'd like to thank you all for coming along tonight. We've certainly enjoyed being here talking about invasives. And just before I go, 
Um, I would just like to mention that this is the last talk that we are doing in our view from the riverbank series for this spring summer hopefully we'll be back in the autumn but it is a free event but if you did enjoy tonight please do donate to our 25th anniversary appeal and we've put a qr code on here so you can just hold your phone up and um, use your camera to just click on the take a picture of the qr code and it will take you straight to our website if you haven't got your phone handy you can just go to edenriverstrust.org.uk backslash donate but anyway it's been great to have you all with us i hope you've enjoyed it and i hope it sort of distracted you all from the rain and the wind outside so from all of us i'd like to say good night and thank you very much.